Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? Nathan, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited about today's episode. We kind of went over the notes a couple days ago, and man, I, I already I'm predicting we're going to smash it out of the park with this one. Boom. Okay, well, here you go. When you sit down to write your copy, do you shake in fear because of the terror of the blank page? Or maybe you're not terrified, but you're frustrated because you don't know where to start? Today, we're going to talk about a game-changing method delivered by one of our industry's great old masters, Eugene Schwartz. He delivered a powerful secret in an obscure talk he gave in the early 1990s to Robe Dale Press. You won't find this secret in either of his landmark books, Breakthrough Advertising or The Brilliance Breakthrough. The secret is explained in the words from this talk he gave to Rodale. You do not write copy. You assemble it. You are working with a series of blocks and putting the building blocks together, putting them in certain structures. You're building a little city of desire for your person to come and live in. You are assembling claims that are simply images people will pay for. So the key idea here is assembling, not writing. And it's a very important insight, which we'll really get into today. But make no mistake, first we'll get into this. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So, you know, Nathan, before we get into this, I want to share that quote from Jordan Peele, the filmmaker, the comedian, the writer, actor. He says, when I'm writing the first draft, I'm constantly reminding myself that I'm simply shoveling sand into a box so that later I can build castles. Okay, so that's interesting, right? I mean, he gets this in a very different context. He, he understands that when he's writing his first draft, even if he's not doing it quite as deliberately and systematically as Gene Schwartz was talking about, He's just creating the pieces of what will go into the final product, and he doesn't know what order they'll go in or which ones they'll use or anything else. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. What, what do you want to say about this before we jump in? Uh, I would say that this is often the easiest way for me to get started with a piece, and we'll get into the reasons why as we go through this episode, but uh, 100% I like the idea of um, – filling up the buckets with sand before you actually start building the sand castle. Okay. So let's start out with um, a, a baseline idea. And that is the law of one always rules. And the law of one means your copy should be based on one big idea, one major promise, one overall claim and one and just one call to action. And I have very smart, experienced clients that say, well, can I put two alternate calls to action in at the end so people have a choice? And the answer is no. You can put an upsell in or a downsell if you want, but just give them one call to action after you have eliminated everything else. All right. So law of one. Now, the law of one kind of means that you need to know what that one thing is before you even start assembling copy. Mm -hmm. And that's not entirely true. But if, if you're working on these puzzle pieces, you do need to have some idea of what the completed puzzle looks like. So it means you've done some research. And when, when you assemble your bits of copy, you first work on, but you'll work on it at a later time. You need to have a few things worked out, at least in broad general outlines your target market, your offer, what's unique about your offer. Now, this isn't set in stone. This is more like set in sand, to go back to Jordan Peele, right? You can call this placeholder stuff because you can refine it later. But if you start with the basics of what you're going to write as a jumping off point, you're, you're in much better shape. 
I'm going to jump in real quick. Uh, going back to the law of one, something that I have found over and over again is every additional thing that you give them a choice to do on the sales page. So if there's a toolbar at the top that says go to the home page, or if there's a pop up that says sign up for my newsletter, or if there's a uh, buy version A, and if you don't like version A, maybe you like a totally different offer, offer C. Uh, every time that you add an additional thing for them to do, it decreases the probability of them doing the one thing that you want them to do by however many extra options. So you put in two extra options, there's only a third of a chance now that they're going to do the one thing that you really wanted them to do. So making sure that you're working towards that one thing, beginning with the end in mind, as they say, and only leading to that one thing is the only thing that makes sense when writing sales copy. Yeah, that's great. That's a great point. And I mean, um, a, a simple way to understand this is, okay, let's say you're at my house and you want to go to the ocean and I'm, I'm busy. I can't go with you. So I could just say, go out the front door, take a left, and then take a right, and keep driving, and in about five minutes, you'll be there. But if I said, well, you can go out the front door, and you can take a right, and you can then take a, another right down that next street, or you could take a left if you wanted to and go the other way, or if you want to get there a little faster, maybe you should um, you know, go up the street and then get get out onto Sunset Boulevard and drive about six blocks and then take her. <laughs> I mean, they're going to say, they're going to start cussing at me. They're going to get really mad. Right. Okay. And well, they're not going to know how to get, you know? And then you would throw in, well, and if the beach doesn't sound good, you could always take three rights and then head over to the pier, or you could head over to the shopping center or you could, okay. Now they're not going to the beach at all. Right. Exactly. So le learn, learn about the law of one and internalize it. Even if that's maybe not the way your mind works normally, it, it is when you're writing copy. Mm -hmm. So if, if you don't do some placeholder stuff ahead of time, if you don't have some general idea of the general direction, you can spend a lot of time generating bullets, testimonials, and answers to objections you'll never be able to use in your finished product. Mm -hmm. But you, you can avoid um, a lot of this by knowing what you're doing and where you're going, at least in broad general terms from the start. I mean, is, is, you know, I know that you said up front that you use this, um, assembling approach a lot, Nathan. So it, do you find that it's good to set some broad parameters, a general direction ahead of time? Do you do that? Yeah. Usually I'll have, uh, idea percolating what's the what's the one thing that's going to kind of tie this whole piece together i'll still when i work this way because i work this way pretty frequently i'll still come up with stuff that doesn't get used in the final piece but a lot less if i have a clear direction on where i'm going i'm i make a lot less divergent turns that don't end up going anywhere yeah and and by the same token don't get too bound by where you think you're going just come up with stuff that probably might fit later down, like like you just said, right? Um, some of it you're not going to use. That's okay. Um, you you can't be totally efficient um, when you don't quite know where you're going. I mean, th there's a this is a, a creativity phase, you know, creativity in the sense that you're coming up with some really good ideas, benefits, angles, not like, oh, for example you know, adding an emu to your promotion <laughs> or something. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, I know you love it when I bring that up. And the other thing, it's okay to come up with a few different hooks. It's okay to come up with a few contenders for your origin story. Mm -hmm. It's less pressure that way. You don't have to shoehorn everything in. Now that we understand that there is a little that you need to do before you start assembling copy, I, I want to point out that assembling copy makes writing the actual copy easier because it allows you to zero in on all the parts that really need your focus, need your attention ahead of time without worrying about the big picture or the transition or the 
competition or any any number of other things. So compare this. You you spend maybe a day or two writing really good bullet points and nothing else. Compare that to you've written your copy and you have this um, section that says bullet points go here and you just start banging stuff out and it's not illiterate it's not pointless but it's kind of lame and and flaccid and you know ho-hum hmm. uh, i mean what difference is that going to make huge difference right i i'll say when i first started writing copy i was consuming everything i could find and i came across a hard to find seminar interview with you and mm-hmm. you were promoting uh, some templates that you had written. Yep. And they were immensely helpful when I first started to have that template, to have the thing that says, bullet points go here. It was great. But as I got better and better at writing copy, I went more towards what we're talking about today because this is what works better. Once you have an understanding of what works and what doesn't, having this more free-flowing approach Definitely, in my experience, is is what works better. But for beginning copywriters, I'm not going to knock on them if they're still using the bullet points go here method. Yeah, and um, I did that 20 years ago. And I would also say that those things are really good, like training wheels, you know, until, until you get the feel of it. And then you can ride without even holding out of the handlebars if you want. You know? Yep. This is about just focusing on one thing, focusing on a really strong guarantee when there's nothing else in your plate and you don't need to say, well, does that fit into the headline? Does that is, you know, am I using the same language I'm using? No, just really focusing on the guarantee without thinking about anything else. It means you'll come up with a better guarantee than if you wrote it when you felt like you were up to your eyeballs and alligators, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, We've had a couple of episodes over the last month or so. One of them was starting with your end in mind, starting with your offer so that you're not brain burnt out by the time you get there. And then we also did an episode about the strengths of starting with your bullets or just kind of bulleting out your sales copy first and then moving from there. Um, I I think that's kind of a point of this episode is that there's different ways you can start your sales copy. You can approach it from different angles and... Um, my tattoo artist, he does this a lot in his art. When, when he's tattooing on me, he'll get to a point where he gets bored and he's burnt out and he's like, I can't do shading anymore. I'm going to switch the heads of this, of the tattoo machine and I'm going to use a different needle. And now I'm just going to go and do my, my flat blacks. And then he gets bored with that. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to go and do some shadowing again, or I'm going to go do some line work again. And by doing it that way, it keeps him energized. It keeps him into the piece. And sometimes it's a uh, four or five hours of straight tattooing. So you have to be able to uh, switch things up and, and move to the part that you're most excited about. And same thing with copy. Sometimes I'm working on my hook and I'm like, oh my gosh, this, this, this leads perfectly into a, a great creation story. And so I'll jump over to the creation story and start there and do a couple drafts of that and then see how it fits in once the overall piece is ready to be assembled. Yeah. It it's uh, it's funny about tattooing, writing copy, any kind of creative work like this, where you're going for a very tangible, specific end result. There's this mix of, um, I think John Cleese has some great stuff on creativity, a very funny guy, but he has great stuff on creativity and he, he calls it, you know, open thinking and, and closed thinking. And open thinking is is where you're just creating and with ideas. Closed thinking is where you sort of have a, a set process and you need to focus. And, and, and that comes in too, obviously. It comes in later. You know, you need to really go over, over everything, um, look for inconsistencies, make sure the transition's smooth. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about an earlier earlier part of the process. So the the neat thing about this assembly method is, you know, sometimes when you're just digging into bullets, just bullets, or sometimes you're just dealing with answers to objections, or maybe just the guarantee, maybe the offer. When you're 
totally focused on that, your unconscious mind, and, and this is a strange thing, but it's happened to me over and over again, and I, I wonder if it's happened to you, Nathan. Your unconscious mind is also working on the big picture at the same time. So as, as you're, you know, zeroing in on these bullet points or you're, you're really, you know, um, thinking hard about how to make this guarantee sound and work just right, an idea for a killer hook or a blockbuster headline might pop up along the way. And that's something that wouldn't usually happen if you were just working on headlines or hooks. That happens to me all the time. And that's kind of what I was talking about. Uh, you, you'll be halfway through this. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this would be great for turning it into this other part. And then I just jump around and I make a note. Make sure you go back to the hook because you don't want to forget where you were at. Right. Okay, good. The other thing is sometimes one bullet can become your big idea. Maybe not exactly the way you wrote the bullet, but it'll be a springboard or a, a connection to the big idea or an inspiration, or it'll remind you of something. Uh, another thing is if you have a unique guarantee, sometimes that, that can end up, you know, in, in your headline. Yeah. The other thing that I really like about this approach is sometimes I can't come up with a headline or I can't come up with a hook first. I'm trying and I'm, I'm, I'm beating my head into a wall trying to figure out what the, what the big idea of this piece is going to be. And so if I have multiple ways that I can approach it, if there's only one door in and I can't get through that door, then I'm stuck outside. But if there's 15 doors in, I can start with the bullets. I can start with the offer. I can start with the hook. If there's a bunch of different ways to get in and I'm not restricted to that one door to get in, then it's much more likely that I'm going to get in and I'm going to find some place to start out and then can grow from there. But again, if I'm stuck to, I have to write it in this templated format where I write this part first and this part first, and then this part second, uh, if I have to do it that way, a lot of times that's what causes the blank page blues. That, that's what causes me frustrated staring at a blank page. Do you want to do a recap of today's episode? So the, the first thing, the first main point, the law of one always rules. So that means even if it ends up not being the final direction, you should start out with a, a certain direction, a certain target audience, main promise, main offer, that kind of thing. Um, and you use that as your jumping off point to, to get into doing these little puzzle pieces, these little things that you're going to assemble. The second thing to remember is assembling copy makes writing copy easier because it allows you to zero in on all the parts that really need your focus. And when you're putting the whole piece together, you don't have to start from scratch on things like the bullets or, I mean, th those things are done. And the third thing is there's a like a unexpected bonus that comes with this, and that is when you are digging into bullets and answers to objections and whatever you're digging into, sometimes when you're giving that all your focus, it allows your unconscious mind to do its best work and come up with a killer hook or a headline for you without your making any specific effort to do that. The one thing that I'll add to this at the end as we're leaving is a lot of times this for me is like a week long process. I will have it percolating when I'm going on my walks in the evening. I'll be thinking about it when I'm just doing random things and having that, okay, this is where I kind of want the piece to go. And then I keep Evernote on my phone. So as for each piece that I'm working on, I'm like, oh, this would make a good idea for a hook, or this might be a good bullet, or this might be a good uh, differential, what makes mine desirably different than the competition. And I'll just kind of put those in Evernote as I'm going with the end result kind of in mind, kind of fuzzy and foggy. And then three or four days into that process, all of a sudden it just snaps together. And I'm like, oh my God, everything, in, all the inspiration, all the, the stew of everything just comes out perfect. And it's like, all right, time to turn the heat on and sit down, sit down and start writing. Yeah. So this has got to be a hypothesis. It's never going to be a proven theory because we don't know what's going on on in our unconscious mind. That's why it's called unconscious. But I think there's a, a real good possibility that the unconscious mind can keep track of and recombine and test different combinations of far more things than we ever imagined. 
And when we give it some time and we give it enough correlated, relevant, valuable input, it'll do a lot of those things if, if that's what you're working on in a conscious level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I dig it. So for copywriters, this is if you're running into the part where you just don't know where to start on a piece, try this method, try this approach, and you'll be amazed. I I can't see it going. I'll take that back. I can see it going wrong. But if you're just trying to get started on a piece and you, you keep running into that brick wall, like I think all copywriters suffer with, uh, this is a great way to get started. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. All right. So (laughs) if you enjoyed this episode, head on over to copywriterspodcast.com. You can check out more there. And while you're there, make sure that you're subscribed so that you never miss an episode in the future. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later.